All right, we're back on the show, hitting the home stretch. Now we can relax. Well, for a second, and then we're going to talk about some pretty tense things, right? So <laughs> I'm still going to relax. Okay, okay. You do, we have you Kevin Annett joining us here. Kevin, it's been tough to schedule you actually getting in here, but here you are. It's good to be here, always. And, and the funny thing was, I, I was telling you that last night I was out with this guy, uh, Rob. Uh, Rob. Uh, anyways, Rob from California, and he said, do you know Ken, Kevin Annett? And I go, yeah, he's going to be on the show tomorrow. What, it just came out of nowhere? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's crazy synchronicity, man. I know. Either that or someone's following Kevin. I don't know why that would happen. Oh. <laughs> okay, Kevin, so uh, let's get into it. you got the new book. Can, do you want to hold that up and uh, just show this book wasn't out the last time you were here? At, at the mouth of a cannon, it's, that's from a quote from an Indian agent on the west coast of Canada near Port Alberni. And he's describing how the Indians gave up their land. They were forced to at the mouth of a cannon. And he talked about the inevitable result when a superior culture encounters an inferior one. Guess what happens? He says, British Columbia is no different. It kind of, to me, encapsulates not only the issue that got me fired, but kind of like our reality in this country. Um, I talk about what I call the octopus in that book, that triangle of business interests, government, and church that caused the genocide, grabbed the land, and really is still running the country. So. Yeah, nutshell. well, I think uh, Chairman Mao said power issues from the barrel of a gun. Yes. And uh, the more I think about it, uh, that's, uh, just, that's just the way it is. Now, I know we're going to get into this later on, but, uh, but that's, that's a, a perfect example of the kind of double think that we were discussing, that, that we kind of think of ourselves as Canadians as being kind and gentle and well we didn't we didn't just kill natives wholesale like they did in the states we were we were so much better to them than that yeah we didn't put them up against a wall and shoot them generally we infected the children with tb and never treated them we used germ warfare rather than bullets although don't forget like in it, like any country that did genocide their canada experienced exactly what america and other countries did and that is in the early phase you wipe out 90 percent of the people and the way it happened on the west coast of Canada was through the missionaries and, and inoculations. I and mean, that's been documented more and more. After they depopulate, then they convert the remnant. But all you ever hear about in the history books is that latter stage, when you began to convert these Indians who, gee, there don't seem to be many of them around for some reason anymore. Right. Mm. But we now talk about the early phase because, well, it would upset the children. Right? Yeah. So, yeah, now, okay, so I'm... Uh, I think I can anticipate your answer, but do you think that that was, I mean, it's hard to imagine that missionaries who are uh, Christian missionaries would deliberately commit genocide. Do you think that there was, was it a deliberate act? Was it deliberate on the part of everyone who was involved? Or was it, um, you know, was it ignorance? Was it maybe that people didn't know that, that uh, the natives perhaps wouldn't, be able to tolerate the diseases that were going to be brought in and that sort of thing? I think if people know anything about the history of Christianity, that you'd have no problem saying, well, of course they, they did it, because um, like I often say to my the few friends I still have in the Catholic Church, um, do a body count. You guys have killed more people than any institution in human history, and yet there's the double thing. You're worshiping the gentle Jesus, right? Yeah. And, and uh, so how do those two things coexist? Um, Yes, they knew what they were doing, but they didn't think it was murder. We felt it was, it was doing it for the best reasons. I mean, that, that's what, it's like in, in a genocidal system, not only do you have a special language, like the Nazis didn't talk about extermination, they talked about relocation. They talked about, uh, you know, relocating the populations to, to internment camps. They didn't talk about genocide. Or, or extermination. Uh, in Canada, we talked about assimilation, we talked about civilizing, but we didn't want to go down those dirt roads to see exactly how it was being done. Mm -hmm. Even though, you know, the classic case, and I, in my book, murderbydecree.com, um, there's an article, the headline of the Ottawa Citizen, November 15th, 1907, um, uh, describing the report of Dr. Peter Bryce, Indian Affairs doctor, where he said two thirds of the Indian children were dying in these Indian schools because of a practice of deliberately exposing them to TB and smallpox. Mm. Uh, Natives die from white plague was the title of the article. Well, 
That's known on a leading Canadian newspaper on the headline 1907, yet as Noam Chomsky would say, it's all down the memory hole. It's like, why do we forget? Well, because we want to forget. We don't want to know, you know. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and, and we pretend that we're doing, we're doing them a favor by giving them anything, too. Right. Um, I'm reading a book called uh, Stolen Continent, I think, right now, Stolen Continents, and, and uh, it deals with the, the fall of five major civilizations in, in the Americas. And you can just see from the, uh, the land that the Iroquois inhabited when the white people came, and then these tiny little pockets that they're allowed to, allowed to maintain now. And we pretend that that's great that we that they've got that land. Hmm. Yeah. So um, I would love to for you to talk about um, about exactly how you um, um, were ejected from the church that that you decided to join. Well, I was raised in the United Church, you know, and I got ordained when I was uh, thirty-two, and uh, had two children with my wife Anne. And my second posting, I had worked here in Toronto actually at Fred Victor Mission down on Queen and Jarvis and uh, raised some hackles there because I discovered that there was all this money being laundered through the mission and all these tenants being evicted uh, by staff who were dealing drugs in that. And yeah. so I just wrote a letter to the board director about that and we part of company. So for some reason, the United Church then accepted my application to go to Port Alberni, which was the center of this genocidal assault. And I, you know, I often think that institutions with a lot of blood on their hands have, an, have kind of an unconscious death wish. Mm. They want mm -hmm. this stuff to come out, but they don't have the courage to, or the chutzpah to, to Well, there's, there's no good to time to admit to genocide, no, but, let's face it. But maybe, you know, we'll get this guy, Kevin, who's this <laughs> rebel rosy to go find it out. So sure enough, I'm, after Fred Victor Mission, I'm hired by St. Andrew's United Church in Port Alberni, summer of 1992, because they're a dying congregation. They, they knew I had worked for a long time in community ministry. I, I knew how to bring in people. And so I took the congregation from 10 to 80 people in about six months. And uh, what happened was the people coming in happened to be Aboriginal, which was unusual because, you know, still in Port Alberni, there's a real divide, white, native, and you just don't mix natives and whites in church. I mean, it just didn't happen. Remember, Fred Bishop, my chair board, I went up to him at the end of the first service. I said, Fred, I notice there aren't any Indians in the church. And he kind of looked at me like, like this. And, and sort of like, a, well, of course there's he not. He said, they keep to themselves and we keep to ourselves. Everybody likes it that way, Kevin. That was his answer. So that got me curious, and I began to visit Native homes. Very, and this is in my documentary film, Unrepentant. The very first Native home I went into, Danny Gust, this retired Native fisherman, tells me, his best friend had been killed in, in the Alberni school and buried in the hills out back. And he said the church people all knew about it, didn't want us in their churches, right? So, well-known fact in the native world and in the white world, but we just don't want to go there. We don't want to look at the dragon in the living room, folks. Uh, what happened, though, was that, and this is why I wrote this book, after two years, my local, even the kind of the, the um, reactionary element of my congregation, they. They liked what I was doing because I had expanded the church and, you know, it, it, was, it was growing. And, and uh, what clinched my fate, though, was that two things. I was letting survivors from the residential school speak from my pulpit. I had an open pulpit policy, so I began to hear these things. But the thing that clinched it was big money. Um, I found out that the United Church had been selling off land that their missionaries had originally grabbed on the west coast of Vancouver Island selling it off to one of their corporate benefactors, McMillan Blodell, who at that very time in 1994 were being, it was the biggest corporate acquisition in British Columbia history. Weyerhaeuser in Seattle was buying up McMillan Blodell. And the, what was uh, sweetening the deal was there were all these chunks of old growth forests in the possession of the church because the early missionaries had grabbed it. So the church was doing this backroom deal where they were getting uh, the land in the hands of McMillan Blodell so they could you know, be bought up by wires and more completely. And I wrote a letter about it very naively, or however you want to describe it, stupidly, uh, to the church, saying, wait a minute, our policy says we can't do that. We have to return native land in our possession back to the native nation that we stole it from. You know, another politically correct policy, I just cited it, and I figured, okay, well, they're going to say, oh my God, 
<laughs> we, we forgot, we didn't, really, we didn't look at our policy. You're right, Kevin, okay. Instead, a series of secret meetings go on where my uh, eviction is being planned. And this all came out later, not only in my delisting trial, defrocking. Mm -hmm. I was the only <laughs> minister, proudly to say, the only minister to be publicly defrocked in United Church history <laughs> at the cost of $300,000. Um, and this all came out there and in my divorce trial um, because my wife left at the behest of church lawyers who approached her after the, she divorced me, got custody of the kids. Um, but this all came out on the court records there that they, were, they had planned the, my removal in secrecy right after I wrote that letter. And they told my congregation that I had gone crazy and, you know, the usual kind of smear you do on a whistleblower. And I was out and uh, I was removed immediately without cause, without any of the provisions of the United Church Manual uh, governing how you would deal with, with ministers. Uh, and my congregation was full to the day I got fired. So, I mean, this whole line that I was somehow alienating people in the church, it was just created after the fact. I got an amazing, rapid, education about what it means to be at the end of the receiving end of being a whistleblower up against a big corporation because it's the same policy uh, approach to people who are an in inconvenience you know so we're talking about the church I guess uh, in this instance the United Church specifically but uh, you also um, you also uh, implicate the uh, royal family and the Vatican and stuff like that. That's I just want to get into all years that. later. Well, you know, that's it's all connected. But um, in a nutshell, obviously, this was more than just one church. Um, it was started centuries ago. The whole policy, the Vatican and the Crown of England were the main motive forces behind the genocide. And years later, I, I was part of a, a common law court action in Brussels that indicted and and convicted. Um, Queen Elizabeth, Stephen Harper, uh, Pope Benedict, others uh, of these crimes against humanity. It was really irrefutable evidence. I mean, the, 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 this is the really weird thing about um, this work. It's never been refuted. I've never been sued. It's never been contradicted. I just get attacked personally. And that's a sign of people who are caught at, you know, with their pants down and they have to distract as any PR specialist But does. who are absolutely excellent at lying. I mean, I just yeah. came, um, Donald Trump was given proof positive that Elizabeth Warren does in fact have Indian heritage, and his answer was, who cares? I don't care. Right, right. And well, if, if you can pull that off, then you can continue to. When you're in power, when you're the power, you can say anything and you're automatically believed. If you're one person against an institution, it doesn't matter what you prove, you're automatically disbelieved. Because, you know, it, people, it, it's, it's fun to talk about people liking David and Goliath battles, but they always tend to side with Goliath because they have... Well, they're scared of Goliath. Power. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And they don't think David can protect them. No. But nevertheless, it's just what I found is the power of truth in this is that all, all I did year after year was I kept publishing this stuff, kept putting it out publicly. And it encouraged people with more evidence to come forward, especially survivors of these crimes. I mean, how does, and it gets into the whole issue of how people can live with these, this contradictory reality in their head. Um, how is it that half the children die every year for over 40 years, and that's been proven now. Statements in, in uh, 1907 from, from Dr. Peter Bryce, and in 1949, both say half the children are dying every year in these, these so-called schools. How does that go on? I mean, because if you're operating from a good intention, as soon as children are done at that rate, you fix it. You bring in yeah. doctors, you change the conditions, but 40 years apart, it's deliberate. And it's, it is, in fact, the main way genocide happened in these places, it's germ warfare. And then the amazing, I mean, here's an anecdote. Uh, uh, my, one of the fellows who's on our documentary film on Repentant, um, Bill Seward, said when he was taken to the United Church School in Edmonton, Christmas Eve, uh, this um, minister would cart them all over to the local United Church and, they, and dress them all up, and they would sing Christmas carols for the church people, and then the church people would give them presents. Uh, the minister um, would then take them back and take all the presents and give them to his own kids, and then he would choose the kid he was going to rape that night, right? 
And he said, uh, sometimes, often, these kids never came out of his room alive. We just never saw these kids again. Okay, so if you're the people sitting in the United Church that night, Christmas Eve, you're seeing these wonderful, oh, look at how we treat these Indian kids, not knowing what's going on. And really, if they heard the story of what went on, um, would they believe it? Yeah. I mean, it does sound fantastic. I mean, it, you know, it, it just sounds unbelievable, that story. Well, there's been enough of them out now of those stories from eyewitnesses. And what I found when, when you say, how did it begin? I, w I would meet people who never knew each other, yet they're telling the same story. I'm, finding, I'm hearing stories of uh, kids having their teeth pulled out. If you didn't behave and didn't sing hymns right and tried to speak your language, you wouldn't get painkiller when the dentist came. You were on a, a group of kids who would just have your teeth yanked without painkiller. I, f uh, I hear this in the healing circle uh, that I began to work in after I was fired from the church. Then, and I reprinted this in my book, I found a document from a dentist in North Vancouver in 1924, two categories of children in the Squamish Residential School, those who received painkiller and those who didn't. So the document confirmed by the eyewitness, that's all you need in a court of law. But that reality hasn't broken through. Uh, we've talked around genocide in Canada. We, we get to third stage of, quote, recovery without talking, without the first two, which is remembering the truth and then grieving. I haven't seen any grief and I haven't seen any tears. I haven't felt among my people any grief about this at all. Uh, just let's forget about it and give money and apology and let's get on. You know, it's avoidance. It's what you do when you're faced with horror, right? So what do you think it is? Is it that we have such a, a powerful alternate narrative about what we are? Or is it just entirely wanting to avoid knowing what happened because that means that you're culpable well we can afford to we won the war you mm -hmm. know we wouldn't know about the death camps if germany had won the war they would have put churchill and roosevelt on trial for bombing dresden right um you know so we we haven't had to deal with it and um so we don't have to change people only change when they have to mm. really and uh, we can toy with humanitarian ideals and everything but when you come right down to it, this whole so-called Truth and Reconciliation Commission in Canada, it's like it was set up with all the finesse of a serial killer appointing his own jury. You know, it's like the churches and government get together, decide what evidence they're going to reveal to the public. If you're a native person and are a good little boy and girl, you can sit in front of the mic and tell your story after you've lo they've, we've looked at it and vetted it first uh, for any reference to a killing or anything. That's what passes for reconciliation in Canada. Right. They've dropped the truth word now, I've noticed. They don't talk about the truth and reconciliation. It's just all reconciliation now. Um, which is another way to say, don't upset the nice feelings we have now uh, by talking about true stories. They really dropped... They oh, yeah, yeah. You just see, in every school, in every library, in the university curriculums, there's reconciliation programs, which is absurd. I mean, we haven't had truth. We haven't had war crimes. We haven't had bodies brought home or forensic analysis done except on this program where we showed the bones that one time from the Brantford School. But um, if you haven't had any of that, how can you talk about mm. making things better? I mean, it's absurd, but I don't know. It's, Kevin, it's, yeah. Yeah. so then what is the, I mean, the, the, whole, the whole issue of, of, uh, of the natives in Canada and all the newcomers that are here, is an issue that doesn't seem to be getting any closer to be to being. No. I mean, we, we're, we're using the word reconciliation, but I mean, I mean, what would do you? Th what would be a real solution to that that whole issue? Because we're all, you know, we're we're all living here. I mean, yeah. what 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 can we do? What is the answer? Well, part of me, yeah, I'm divided on this. The realistic part of me says there's nothing that can be done. Um, because we are acting out a sickness that's been in our culture for really thousands of years. Um, and it isn't just our culture, of course, but I mean, we're, I think in many ways we're the epitome of it. Um, and the other part of me says, yeah, there is possibility of change, but it's like childbirth. It's bloody and violent, and it's, it's not, that's how something new comes to life. It's not a nice process. I remember once we were picketing outside some church in Vancouver and the minister came out and began screaming at me of course not the native people just at me and um, he said well what is it you people want anyway and I said if your child was killed and thrown in a jet somewhere what would you want and I suddenly put it in his 
framework. He said, and he looked totally shocked because he hadn't, I said, what would you want? And he said, well, don't be ridiculous. And I said, no, what would you want? And finally, said, would you want the police to investigate? Well, of course. You know, would, would you want the body back? Would you want the body back? <laughs> would, you, would you want, if, if the perpetrator came to you and offered money for your silence, would you take the money and an apology? Of course not. Well, you're asking that of Indians. Why should they have a separate standard of humanity than we have? But that separate standard is what we expect all the time. There's two standards all the time, mm -hmm. our victims and ourselves. And as long as we have that, no, things won't change. And um, frankly, you know, the Indians are still sitting on a lot of valuable real estate, a lot of resources. That fact has never changed. And the big money calls the tunes. I mean, um, Justin Trudeau ratified a law that Harper brought in called the Foreign Investment Protection Act, which allows China to station security forces on Canadian soil to defend, protect their investments. I mean, it's all about, it's not about sovereignty, it's not about human rights, it's about money and who's determining that. So that's our bottom line. We've proven that as a culture. So no, I don't think, I don't think things are going to change unless some revolutionary developments happen, and, but it's got to start in here. I think we need that grassroots real change, but it'll, it's an agonizing process, and I, I don't find many people willing to step up to the plate with that because it's, it's uh, you know, Canadians were raised to think, well, we, we can't upset things. We like, uh, we don't like, I used to joke with my congregation, um, Jesus wouldn't get along very well in, in Canada because he was always dividing people. As a matter of fact, he said that all the time. I've come not to bring peace, but a sword. Which is what the truth is. It cuts things clearly. It divides people. It causes controversy. And anyway. Well, what, uh, I mean, sometimes I think it's, uh, it's uh, like, I mean, when I look around the world, uh, it's, it's not just a matter even of, um, I mean, if there is a big power from on high, whether it's the, the royal royal family or, or or the Vatican or whoever, some kind of elite global power. I mean, uh, in a sense, my, my vibe is that they kind of used the, they used the poor uh, disenfranchised uh, subjects of, of, of the European countries uh, you know, they took their land, right. and then they came here, and they used those people to take over this continent. And now, and but we're we're all expendable. That's a very good point. And in fact, I don't think we were even used. We did it willingly because we had been messed up back well, we, in the home country. We were desperate to, you know, desperate for for finding our way in the world that where everything had been taken away. Yeah, I mean, it's like in a family, of course, the tendency is you're harmed, you pass on the harm, right? It doesn't always happen, but it's the tendency. And, and, and to look at it, it's like you're swimming in the water. You don't even see what you're doing and what you're thinking as being wrong. And I remember he, hearing this all the time in the healing circles, uh, which is, a, I don't like using the word healing because it's got uh, too much of a political agenda behind it. You're, you're healed now, have some money, now you're fixed, now go away. Um, no, in, the, in, the, in these talking circles where people would tell their stories, um, people would never talk about the worst thing first. And they would always make excuses about the bad things that happened to them. Well, yeah, they broke my arm in residential school, but at least it was better than at home, you know. Uh, it, but there, and then ultimately they say, no, no, it was actually worse. But there, as a victim, you build up all these rationalizations, mm -hmm. levels of rationalization, and it's the double think we're talking about. But it isn't just the victim that does that, the victimizer does it too. Um, because the victimizer is actually more scared than the victim. They're scared, and I've seen that in the eyes of these clergy and the people that hate me so much <laughs> at these levels of church and state. I've been involved in this amazing misinfo campaign for 25 years about this whole campaign. Um, they are so terrified of having to face the consequence, really, of, of who they are and what they've been part of. And um, I know it's a hard thing to do. I had to face it because I had no option. Mm. My family was taken from me. I was blacklisted. My life was destroyed. And I had to look at things because I had, you know, there's a difference between doing something for a good intention and doing something because your life depends on it. And when you're, when you're doing something because your life depends on it, you can't have the illusion of, of 
anymore, the illusions you carried. You've got to be a hard realist about everything and everyone around you. And I had to do that. Um, and so I know I'm speaking from a different place than what even I would have understood 10 or 20 years ago. 20 years ago, I was looking at me now and saying, what the hell happened to this guy, right? Is he crazy or something? But I've had these levels of kind of illusion taken away from me. And based on what I've seen, like my experience, right? And I, it doesn't jive with a lot of what Canadians, but that doesn't, that doesn't change the truth of it, right? Yeah. It just means that it's maybe the first step of, of an evolution we all have to go through. We've got me thinking too about, um, about the incredible range of, of attitudes in the native community itself. Oh yeah. Because um, when you're a victim, yeah. or if you're, if you're lucky enough to not be personally affected, even if you know other people who are, sometimes you minimize for them. You, yeah. you tell them that they didn't have the experience right. they had. So what have you seen in, in the Native community itself? Oh my God. Um, when 90% or more of your people are wiped out, no one's ever done a study on what that does. I remember the US Air Force did a study after the bombing of Cambodia, mm. where, and then the Khmer Rouge, where they killed off about a third of the population. This US Air Force study in the late 70s said, if you destroy 20% of the people, you permanently, you, you've destroyed their culture. They cannot function anymore. Um, well, we did it to 90% of the Indians on average. And the reality is, first of all, the ones who died first were the old and the young. And the old in an oral culture. Hold the legacy. Hold the knowledge. Mm -hmm. Okay. So is there a genuine indigenous culture? I don't know. I, I doubt it. I think people are, are uh, there's some good people trying to recreate it. But it's like me saying, okay, how much do you know about your Scots-Irish heritage? Nothing, really. I don't speak the language. I don't have a sense of what that spirit was, right? And I can't really point to many indigenous people that I know who have that, that rootedness. The ones who I have known are living off the radar, and their lives are endangered all the time. Classic case is Peter Yellowquill, my friend in, in uh, western Manitoba, uh, Anishinaabek. And he has tried to live off reserve, refused to take any fares money, challenged the band council uh, for dealing drugs and, and doing all this corrupt stuff. He's had his trailer burned. He's had his kids thrown in prison. He's on the run all the time. Um, that's the reality if you go up against the government chiefs, you know, who are involved in criminal activity. So there's a real division, you know, between the traditionalists and most native people living on the ground and the natives you're allowed to see. You know, the uh, Aboriginal Achievement Award receivers, you know, uh, the, the native politicians with all the nice jewelry who speak for everybody else, but whose lifestyle has nothing to do with most native folks. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's as messed up as our culture. And um, we, I, I lost a lot of my romantic illusions about Indians a long time ago. But <laughs> now, I know that, uh, you know, oh, I mean, you've done these things with the common law courts that you've somehow, I, I'm not sure what the right terminology, but you've assembled these, you've put these courts together, or you and some other people. Well, we had to. I mean, th again, it happened through stages, and um, you've got to get a sense of this by, it takes, there, there's no three-second soundbite on this, right? You've got to do, put, put Kevin Annett in at Amazon.com, you'll see all the books, but um, I, I, we realized in Canada, after working with lawyers for survivors, that we weren't ever going to get the issue of, of genocide addressed. As a metaphor, a matter of fact, on three occasions, BC, Alberta, and Nova Scotia, I think, their Supreme Courts all ruled that the issue of genocide was beyond the co competence of the courts. They weren't going to rule on it because it involves the Crown, their boss, right? So you have to go outside the country, and we did that. We went over to Europe in 2010. We tried to set up international tribunals to look into this. And we eventually brought all that evidence to a common law court in Brussels that issued a verdict which can now be enforced by any court. That's the thing about a citizen inquiry. The verdict, it's got hard evidence that any court can issue arrest warrants over. That's what has people in the church and government worried because they know that a little bit of knowledge out there means that the whole history is going to come out and then everything they've been seeing is going to be proved to be so, but they False. still have the guns yeah. because the common law court that you're referring to, they don't have enforcement. Yeah, right. That's they right. don't have the police, the army. Right. I mean, whoever. They don't have the official courts. 
the admiralty courts or whatever they are. But you know, it's like uh, Sun Tzu says, power is not only what you have, but what your enemy thinks you have. <laughs> and uh, in this case, why did Pope Benedict and four other cardinals all resign when their names came out in an indictment in the record of our court? It's not accidental. It's because they know that even if everybody else doesn't know, that once their guilt comes out like that, other courts can issue arrest warrants. In fact, the Spanish government did send a note to the Vatican that they're considering issuing an arrest warrant five days before the guy resigned in February 2013. So it does have an impact. But if you're a small group and you have to rule everybody else, you have to live with, uh, give people the impression that you're infallible and all-powerful. And mostly it's an illusion. Because I find like the, the perfect example of this is when we were occupying churches and the cops would show up and you'd think, okay, they're going to bust heads, but we went right over to them and it was a battle of hearts and minds. We said, this church has a policy, the Catholic Church has a policy of officially protecting child rapists. If you're a Catholic, you have to not tell the police when a child is raped. I said to the police sergeant many occasions, are you seriously going to protect that we're doing nothing here but sharing information with people. You were seriously going to protect that because that makes you a, an accessory to a crime. They would either stand back and not intervene or leave every single time because they knew we were right. And they were fathers and grandfathers as well. And they knew the truth of this. So it takes long, but it's a gradual um, moral, you keep the moral and evidentiary high ground and, and you've got a, a power over them that they don't know how to deal with, frankly, I think. That's been our experience. Well, that sounds like an optimistic uh, viewpoint. It I was going to say, it, it sounds it, a lot it, more optimistic than you were earlier. In the sense I told you, I've got two minds on this. That, you know, <laughs> optimistic in the sense that maybe this thing can actually come around, the truth will come out, and justice will be served. But on the other hand, I'm thinking about, I think it was Big New Brzezinski said that, uh, you know, a couple hundred years ago, it was easier to control uh, a, a million or 500 million people than it was to kill uh, a million people. But now it's it's easier to kill a million people than it is to control a million people. And I'm just wondering if, you know, things are going to get so close that the powers that be are just going to pull the pin on that global hand grenade and launch P Project Loopy. Well, I don't know. They haven't done it yet. <laughs> you know, I, I remember... Uh, a well, friend of mine, Joe Hensby, said to me once, um, I'd, he was uh, in his 70s at the time, it was, it was like 40 years ago, and I was an up-and-coming young radical in Vancouver, and Joe was a communist longshoreman who'd been shot at by the RCMP, and he had bullet holes, you know, he, he like was a veteran, right? And he said, and we were sitting over a beer one night, and I said, so Joe, you know, he's all, he said, you must have seen great changes in the world, Joe, since the 1930s, and he said, no, not really. I, th I think I've done dick all to change the world, but I didn't let them, those bastards change me. That was his final answer at the end of a lifetime. So, I mean, maybe that's the only kind of answer we have at the end. You know, I did what was, I, I knew was right, and I couldn't live with myself otherwise. Why the hell can more people do that? I don't think it was a great thing. I th it was just a necessary thing mm -hmm. to do that. And, um, you know, it comes down to that maybe. Okay, so the new book is out at the mouth of a can. I'm just going to hold it here. Uh, people can get this on your website, right? Or links uh, to it? or Murderbydecree.com. Okay. ITCCS.org. And uh, Amazon. All my books are up at Amazon. Great. Yeah. And what are you working on next? Uh, sequel to our documentary film, Unrepentant. We're um, going out and looking at how the, this two aspects how the genocide is continuing and how people are changing in response to it. Like we want to actually go into white and native communities and say, how has this affected you? How are you looking at Canada differently now? What kind of new deal do you think we should have in Canada? Whether it's a republic or you know, severing ties with the crown, local self-governance, all the things we talked about on the other show. How can we bring that about in our communities now? And we want to use that document as a catalyst. I mean, the first documentary sparked the apology and all this stuff coming out mm -hmm. in 2007 and eight. And we're hoping this documentary will do the same kind of thing. But I've written a play um, um, doing a lot more kind of a literary uh, approach to this because, we, we, you know, it's about changing. you got to sneak in there, yeah. you got to, well, <laughs> gee, I don't know. I hope I don't have to sneak, but I don't like sneaking. But um, I know what you mean. But you've got to appeal at many levels. 
uh, yeah. about this stuff. You got to fake them out. You got to think like Sun Tzu, Art of War, yeah. Guerrilla Warfare. Yeah. Okay. Well, Kevin, always great to have these conversations. Thank you. Is there anything you want to let people know about that you didn't have a chance to say today? Um, well, yeah, look at yourself in the mirror and ask yourself how you're holding two contradictory thoughts in your mind at the same time. That's called double think. It's how Big Brother tries to control us. But I actually think at the end of the day that it's not going to happen. I got ultimate hope. But based on what I've gone through and seen on the ground, not just some airy-fairy idea, but my own experience, I'm, I'm still alive and I shouldn't be, frankly. Mm. So that's a cause for hope, right? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, well, thanks for doing this. Thank you. And thanks, Jen. Great. Thanks, Jen. Great show today. Yeah. So we're going to say bye-bye for now. We're going to go out and enjoy this beautiful sunny day here in yeah. Toronto. And uh, we'll be back tomorrow for more Liquid Lunch right here on thatchannel.com.